Hello everybody and welcome to this Easy 11 Plus live lesson on writing instructions which is a popular topic in the CSSE ESSIC exams, ESSIC exams, but it should be useful for anybody who wants to develop their writing skills. It's quite an interesting kind of task. It seems easy on the face of it, but actually most people find it really difficult. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, don't forget. Um, don't forget that these live lessons are every Tuesday evening at six o'clock on this channel, and you can look in the channel to find lots of other videos. If you like what I do, if, blah, 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 start that again. If you like what I do here, have a look at the RSL Educational website and the shop page there where there are lots of my books, and have a look at the 11 Plus Lifeline online service that I offer, which is also linked through the website there, and I can do things like mark your work and give you feedback and send you lots of useful resources. And finally, there are some freebies linked in the video description if you want to start with some free resources and solutions. Right, enough of that. Don't forget to subscribe. Let's get started. So, um, this is a, oh, these bells in the background are driving me mad. Anyway, hopefully you can't hear them too loudly. Right, so, um, with a task like this, you get a simple job that you have to describe for somebody. And when people get a task like this, they often don't have a clue what to do. So I'm going to start with some thoughts about what to do and what not to do. Now, I think there's one rule which, above all others, is most important, which will help you to get through this well, and that is be precise. If you think about exactly what you're describing and find the best words to describe it really clearly and precisely, you will write well and you will produce a good set of instructions. Second thing which is really important is think of the reader and think of them as somebody who is going to use these instructions. So as you write, always put yourself in the reader's position and think what questions would they be asking? Is this clear for them? Am I covering the details that might occur to them that might not be clear. And if you ask yourself that sort of thing, and then you write what you're going to, what you, what you want to say precisely, you'll communicate with them really well and produce something that's impressive. Other things, don't list, don't write point one, point two, point three. Write a paragraph that flows and where the ideas naturally connect into each other. Um, and I think I've said it already, but be very precise. That is the main thing. If you do those things, you'll do well. So we have a blank space here for some notes and some planning. Oh, a big uh, shout out to Ruby Sapphires in the comments who says that they, she or he, um, are here for the first time. A big welcome to you and a welcome to everybody who's here for the first time and a welcome to those people who have come back for yet another Easy 11 plus lesson. I don't know why Tahir is still writing, start, start. I've started. You're watching it. I'm going. So the task says in six or seven sentences, do that. Write six or seven sentences. Don't write four. Don't write nine. Aim to write six or seven. Explain how to brush a pet animal's fur. So you might not have a pet, but it's a simple task. You can imagine yourself into that situation and write some sensible things, even if you don't routinely brush a pet. Use the blank space for notes and planning. You won't necessarily see that in the exam, but it's helpful to be reminded that it's good to do a little bit of planning first. So in this space, we're just gonna write some notes about the kind of things you might cover. Now, what we're not gonna start by doing when we write our answer is with a list of things. So we're not going to write, have ready a brush, a paper bag for the fur, um, a pet, because that just wastes space and doesn't show any writing skills. If you need to introduce items, mention them when they come up in the instructions. That's quite important. That's a common mistake that people make. So, um, where might we start here? I think the first thing we've got to start with is getting the pet, so holding the animal. So I'm just gonna write a note, hold animal. I'm not going to write lots of detail because that's going to happen when I write my answer. This is an exam. We don't have time to plan in lots of detail. Hold animal. Um, when we're brushing them, we're going to use uh, gentle strokes. So I'll put that down. That's going to be the important feature of how to brush them. Um, and we need to think about the questions that someone might ask as they do this. So they might be thinking, okay, I'm going to be brushing off this old fur. What am I going to do with it? So what to do with fur? What to do 
with... Now, I'm really not worrying about my handwriting here because this is for me when I write my answer. These are my notes. It doesn't matter if the examiner can't read them. It matters a little bit if you can't, but I'm reading them out loud as I write them. Um, what to do with fur? Um, you're brushing your animal. What might you be wondering? I think you might be wondering, when do I stop? And that will be a natural thing to cover next. So when to stop? And then at the end, if I still have writing space, anything else. Now, I don't need to decide what anything else might be now, because when I'm writing, I'll be thinking about the situation and other things that I might want to cover will come to mind. Now, one of the things that I think is quite neat about this simple plan is that it allows me several possible jumping off points because we're allowed six or seven sentences. So, if I've already written seven sentences when I've got to what to do with fur, well, if I've described how to hold the animal, how to brush them and what to do with the fur, that's a complete set of instructions. It's a natural stopping point. If I haven't used my sentences and I've still got writing space, then when to stop brushing would be a natural finishing point. And if I write that and I've still got sentences less left, then I can still add some footnotes with anything else to use up my sentences. So I haven't given myself a very rigid set of sentences, sentence one, sentence two, sentence three. I've given myself room to write naturally, and that's really helpful. So a basic plan like this is quite a useful way to get going. Um, it's nice to see there are lots of people watching because this is a, I've, you know, publicised this as something for the Essex CSSE exam. So I thought there might be a very small group of people viewing just the people preparing for that exam. It's really great that lots of other people are here because they recognise that all writing practice is useful writing practice. So well done for being here. Right, onwards to writing our answer. So, oops. So the first thing we had was hold the animal. So now we have to think about that situation. So um, I'm going to write this in a way that could cover a cat or a dog. I know that this task could cover a guinea pig. I'm going to think of a cat or a dog. Um, and I'm going to try and write in a way that might cover either. But what I've got in mind as a you know, habitual cat owner is a cat that I've got on my lap. So how am I going to hold this cat? Well, if I don't hold it, it's liable just to get bored and jump off at some point when I haven't done the job. So I'm going to have to hold it in some way. But then you have to think, well, do I hold it really tightly? No, because it won't like it. It would be unkind to it, but also it might encourage it to try and escape. So I need to hold it kind of firmly, but not squish it too much. Um, not in an unpleasant, not in an unpleasant way. So I need to hold it without causing it discomfort. It's quite a nice phrase. It's come to mind. We can use that. Um, why do I want to hold it firmly? So it doesn't get away, but also because if I hold an animal confidently, that gives it a sense of confidence and security. Um, so let's put those ideas together. Um, so you want to hold your pet firmly and confidently without causing it discomfort. The without causing it discomfort is really important, so let's start with that. You could say without hurting it, but without causing it discomfort is more precise because you can cause discomfort to something without causing it pain. Something could be uncomfortable without being painful. So you know what I said about the best phrases coming from being very precise? That's where we're going here. Uh, 11 plus master has put they could stroke it. Yes, that would be a great idea. You could write about stroking your pet before you start brushing to calm it down and get it used to the gentle movements. That would be an excellent idea. Um, they've also written it could purr at you. Yes, but we're giving instructions to the person doing the grooming, not to the pet. Um, but, but I agree, it's a good sign if it's purring. Um, right, so where were we? So we said without causing it discomfort, which was our precise phrase, without causing it discomfort, and so we enter into the horror of my handwriting. Without causing it discomfort, hold your pet, and we said firmly and confidently. Hold your pet firmly and confidently. Now you see how we got some good language in there, not because we were looking for clever words, this is an important point, but just because we wanted to say exactly what we meant. So we weren't talking about just pain, we were talking about discomfort in general, so without causing it discomfort was a natural phrase to use, it's also really good English. Hold your pet firmly and confidently, 
Again, some very precise adverbs for how you should hold your pet that exactly describe what we want. Now, why should you hold it confidently? The reader might want to know that. Again, we're thinking about the questions that a reader might be asking. Why confidently? Firmly is obvious, but confidence isn't. Well, if you hold them confidently, you'll reassure them about what's going to happen so they aren't going to be scared of it. Um, so we don't want to repeat confidently. What does it do if you hold them confidently? It shows that you're in charge. By showing that you're in charge, or we can say by showing your authority. Again, good language that precisely says what we want. So, and notice how we're linking ideas here. By showing your, we're talking to you, the person following the instructions, by showing your authority, um, you will reassure them, them as the pet, about what is going to happen. Okay, so now we've got two sentences which are a very clear statement about how to hold your pet and why. I put them here to describe the pet. Um, in the not so old days, if you were talking about a person or an animal in general, it would have been conventional just to say him and it was implied, it was understood that him meant a male or a female. Uh, nowadays, because we don't want to imply that everything is about men and women are somehow less important, um, we often use them, which used to be just a plural. Uh, for more than one person to refer to an individual whose sex or gender we're not specifying. Um, so that's an example of how language adapts itself around changing changing social expectations. Um, an interesting point in passing, I hope. Uh, okay, you will, so we've got so far. Without causing it discomfort, hold your pet firmly and confidently. By showing your authority, you will reassure them, you could also say it, about what is going to happen. Okay. So now the second part of our plan was gentle strokes. So now we're going to talk about the stroking itself, which is really important because that's the main thing that this task is about. So how are we going to brush them? Well, um, one thing I'm sure you know, even if you don't own a pet, is that you don't brush against the line of the fur. That's really annoying for the animal and they're likely liable to dig their claws in, nip you or just run away. Um, so we don't want to do that. Um, so we want to brush following the fur, the fur. Okay, what else? Do we brush in a kind of jerky... F no, of course we don't. We want to brush, brush smoothly. And we want to have a nice rhythm about it so that they can expect the brush to keep landing so they aren't surprised by it and shocked. And again, so they don't dig their claws in or jump up. So all of these things, some of them might not be obvious if you don't own a pet, but even then you'll come up with other ideas. Um, but these are all quite simple things. I'm not trying to be too clever about it. So we want to brush gently. We want to have regular movements. You can call them strokes of the brush. That's quite a common, uh, a common noun to use here. And we need to need to not brush against the fur. If we're not brushing against it, what are what are we doing? We're following it. We're following the direction that the fur naturally takes. So how can we say that nice and concisely and clearly? So we want to. So we're giving an instruction, an imperative. So brush. In, gentle. We said that. Regular strokes. That was the word we came up with. Someone in the comments said my handwriting isn't so bad. Thank you, but you may be regretting that now. Um, uh, Ashok has written, first pick up your pet gently and make sure you don't cause discomfort. Lovely. That would be an excellent beginning. Well done. Um, um, so a good question from Karine or Karina. I will come back to in a sec. Um, so I haven't forgotten it. Brush in gentle, regular strokes. Um, and we said following the fur's natural direction. following the fur's natural direction. If you wanted to be more fancy, I guess you could say following the fur's natural contours would be a nice way of putting it actually, um, but this is fine. We don't always need to jump for the fancy vocabulary, 
Be precise. Focus on saying exactly what you want to and the English will look excellent. Okay, so this is really simple. Um, I haven't overcomplicated it. I haven't taken up too much space. Um, I've now got three sentences down and I'm well into um, I'm well into the task. I'm dealing absolutely with what I've been asked to deal with by the examiner. Uh, a lot of people find it difficult to place their commas correctly. So let's take a moment out to, um, um, to talk about commas. Uh, first of all, though, I'm actually going to answer that question before it disappears off the comments. So Karine uh, Gazarian, Gazarian said, um, looks like an Armenian name, maybe. Um, I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. Um, should you add very lengthy sentences for adding good information? Um, so um, the answer is basically no. So, and what I mean by that no is that you shouldn't be thinking, I need to make my sentences longer. Because then what happens is you tend to take sentences that should have been separate sentences and just string them together with ands and so on. And it looks artificial and wrong. It looks as though you're trying to f force your work into the six or seven sentence limit. Um, so just write naturally. Link ideas in the way that works out works out for you. My sentences here aren't especially long. They're mostly about um, a line and a half so far. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable length. Uh, if you're developing and adding ideas, some of your sentences will become longer. I think, by and large, a well a well written piece of writing will tend to have a mixture of sentence lengths. But don't worry about it too much. So, good question. Right, I was talking about commas. Um, so. If you're not sure about where to place commas, the best thing you can possibly do in your practice is what I'm doing as I uh, show you this, which is read your work aloud and read it in quite a performative way as though you're trying to communicate to an audience. Without causing it discomfort, hold your pet firmly and confidently. Now, I think it isn't possible to say that sentence without having a big pause after the word discomfort when you perform it like that, as though you're on a stage. And so you can tell there must be a comma there. By showing your authority, you will reassure them about what is going to happen. Again, there has to be a pause after authority. Let's see what happens if I say that sentence without a pause. By showing your authority, you will reassure them about what is going to happen. It sounds wrong. There needs to be that pause. And that tells you where to put the comma. The sentence I've just written. Imagine me saying it without any pauses, like a Dalek. Brush in gentle regular strokes following the first natural direction. It's weird. It wants to sound like this. Brush in gentle, regular strokes following the fur's natural direction. That is how you would say it. And so practice like that with any writing that you do, and you will get a hang of what get the hang of what punctuation is doing and how it falls into place naturally. And then when you're in an exam, where obviously you can't be declaiming to the room, you have that going on in your head. You're hearing the work in your head silently, and so you can achieve the same things. I say that so often in a different context, it's super, super, super important. Uh, Honey Bear XO says, Robert, I'm new here and I'm really enjoying this video. Great work. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, right, onwards, on to the next. So, um, oh, as always, think about um, the questions that someone might ask. So you said, brush in gentle regular strokes following the first natural direction. Now, someone reading these instructions must be doing it because they aren't sure how to brush a pet. So they must be thinking, OK, but what shouldn't I do? What should I avoid doing? Well, what you should avoid doing is anything that's going to upset your pet. What would upset them? Well, I think what would upset them would be if you started sort of raking a brush across their face near their eyes. Um, or sort of dragged it over their ears or down between their legs or anything like that, these sensitive places. So you need to be careful about that. Um, so that's a really good additional detail to write. Again, I've asked, I've thought, what question would the reader ask? And then my answer is going to show a kind of subtle thought about the task. Amina Ali, um, you've been reading my notes. You've said, you've commented, could you also tell them that after the brushing the pet, you might realise that hair is stuck and you're supposed to remove it. Um, have you been looking over my shoulder? Do you know what I've written here? Um, yes, completely. Uh, that's exactly the kind of question you should be asking, and I'm going to get to that. Uh, well done. Uh, okay, anyway. Um, so, um, where were we? Yes, yeah, so about being careful. So, be careful. 
or be particularly careful, because you should be careful anyway, again, I'm being precise, finding exactly the right words, be particularly careful when you're brushing near sensitive points. And then we can give some examples of those. When we're brushing near, that's a bit wordy. Is there a simpler way to say that? Um, in the area of, in the vicinity of. Okay, so again, a really nice bit of vocabulary has come from trying to work out exactly what I'm trying to say, from being precise. Be particular, that's an awful B. Be particularly, that's a horrible spelling word, by the way, particularly, because we always just say particularly, particularly. I'm particularly careful. Be particularly careful, learn that spelling if you don't know it, be particularly careful, oops, carkful, careful in the vicinity of, in the vicinity of, very swanky phrase, in the vicinity of sensitive points. But again, we're writing for someone who doesn't, who isn't very confident, so it's worthwhile giving them some ideas. in the vicinity of, that's horrible, so it says points. Oh, it doesn't, it just says P squiggle squiggle squiggle. I'm gonna write it again. P squiggle squiggle, the cat and the fiddle. Points. Why can I not write the word points neatly? Because I can't write anything neatly. Uh, in the vicinity of sensitive points, and now we're gonna give the examples to help our reader. This is the kind of precision that's impressive for an examiner. Such as, so we said, yeah, we said the eyes, such as eyes, ears, and let's not be squeamish, we're talking about pets, we need to think about these things, and genitals. Oh, he said genitals, but we're talking about a pet, we're giving clear instructions, and it's important for the person to be aware that they shouldn't be raking the brush down um, in places that can hurt. So, be particularly careful in the vicinity of sensitive points, such as eyes, ears, and genitals. And again, think about the natural pauses that come there when we read aloud, so we can hear where the commas naturally want to fall into place. Okay, onwards. Um, so, as was very, um, as someone very uh, intelligently suggested, um, uh, it was Amina, I think, that we need to think about what to do with the left over fur. Uh, so, and indeed, I think that was, yeah, what to do with the fur. It, it was noted in the plan. Um, so now let's think about that. So we've given good space to how to prepare, um, how to brush. So far we've used one, two, three, four sentences. So we're following through nicely. We've got more lines on the next page here, so we're not running short of space. Um, so now we're going to get onto what to do with the fur. Now, if you're somebody who's not used to doing this, how will you know when there's enough fur in your brush that you need to pause and pull it out? So again, ask the questions, ask the intelligent questions, and they will give you good things to write. How will you know? Well, initially the brush will dig in and grip, and then as you're doing it and it fills up, you'll find it's not gripping as well, it's starting to slide over. So when it's starting to grip less well, or less readily, nice turn of phrase again, so just look for these little phrases that, are, that, are, are, that sound nice and communicate precisely, so, whenever you feel the brush gripping less readily, okay, do you grab the loose fur? No, you don't want to damage the brush or hurt your fingers. You want to gently pull it out. There's a verb for that. See my video on choosing the right verbs. Tease out the fur from the bristles of the brush, okay? Um, and then what you're gonna do with it, you're gonna chuck it on the floor. Uh, not if you don't want to really annoy your parents. Um, you probably want to put it in a bag. Let's be ecological and let's say a paper bag. Uh, God, what young people drive me to these days. So, um, these days, I'm so old. Um, so, what are we gonna say? Whenever you feel the brush gripping less readily, you want to tease out the fur, the loose fur from between its bristles, and, um, and perhaps put them in a paper bag that you've already set aside. So as I mentioned earlier, don't list all the things you need at the top, mention them as they come up. Uh, so yeah, so whenever, good linking word, whenever, lost track of my spelling there, whenever you feel the brush 
gripping less readily was our nice precise word here. Whenever you feel the brush gripping less readily, um, tease out the loose fur, where from? From between the bristles. Tease out the loose fur from, that does say from honestly, it doesn't say, does it? Does it say from? Um, no, never mind, it says from, uh, from between bristles, okay, and then you, of course, you, you don't need to be strict about where they put it, it's their choice, um, so let's, let's, it, let's make that clear in the way we write it, perhaps putting it, oops, putting it in a paper bag set aside for this purpose. So again, notice two things, that my English is very simple, but also very precise. And that means that it sounds, I hope, good and impressive, because it shows that you have command of English. You can use English to say exactly what you want to say in a way that helps the person reading it, and that is what these exercises are all about. Whenever you feel the brush gripping less readily, tease out the loose fur from between its bristles, perhaps putting it in a paper bag set aside for this purpose. There's nothing fancy about that, but it's good English because it's clear and precise English. Someone asked earlier whether um, we should be trying to write longer sentences, and I said just let them fall out in a way that's natural. This is a much longer sentence. I didn't try to write a longer sentence, it's just the way the ideas came together. Let it happen. And as you practice, you'll get used to finding the rhythm that works best for the situation. Okay, so now I think we're five sentences in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and we've already got to one potential stopping point, but we got, it says six or seven sentences up here, so we should do a little more. So I've got when to stop and anything else if we need that. So what about when to stop? Well, let's think about what someone might do if they're not sure when to stop. They might just keep going and going and going, trying to get a perfect job. And how is the animal going to feel about that? Well, after a while, they're going to feel kind of brushed raw. It's going to start hurting them, chafing. Um, so that's what you don't want to do. So the important advice here is don't try to do a perfect job, okay? Try and just do a good job and stop at a point where you've got a decent amount of fur off. So the key thing is here is don't try and do a perfect job. Don't try to achieve perfection. Okay, which is quite often good advice for life, actually, that I think. Don't, there's an old saying, the perfect is the enemy of the good. So trying to do things perfectly makes it really hard to, um, to start and also makes, you hard, makes it hard just to get a good job then, done and then move on to the next good job because you're still stuck trying to do the one thing perfectly. The perfect is the enemy of the good. It's quite a useful phrase, even if it's a massive cliche. Um, so... Don't try to, don't try, don't try to achieve, we're nearly there, perfection. Okay, that could just be a short sentence by itself, but let's explain it. And that therefore means that a colon is going to be a really good bit of punctuation, which usefully means that we're still in the same sentence in terms of our counting. Don't try to achieve perfection. Why? Because too much brushing can hurt can, maybe that's too strong, can irritate an animal's skin. Too much, there's a nice word for that, ex excessive. Excessive brushing can irritate an animal's skin. Simple, there's no English in there that you won't know. It's good English because it's really precise and uses the shortest number of words, I think, to achieve the goal that we are aiming for. Don't try to achieve per perfection. Excessive brushing can irritate an animal's skin.
Uh, notice, by the way, that the colon here is doing the job of the word because. You could also write, don't try to achieve perfection because excessive brushing can irritate an animal's skin. Notice the comma before because there. Um, the colon takes over and puts a bigger pause in. Don't try to achieve perfection. Excessive brushing can irritate an animal's skin. And if you're reading that aloud, the listener can tell that it's a colon rather than a full stop because of the way that you carry on after it. I'm just going to read this aloud as though it was a full stop. Don't try to achieve perfection. Excessive brushing can irritate an animal's skin. Now listen to how the cadence, the rhythm, the tone is a little bit different when I read it with the colon. Don't try to achieve perfection. Excessive brushing can irritate an animal's skin. So there's a pause, but it's a kind of carrying on, so a sort of wait for it, pause. And that's what the colon brings to the sentence. Punctuation is all about sound. It's all about performance. That's how I like to think of it. I think it's the most useful way to think of punctuation. I think it's much easier than trying to memorise all the rules. Uh, yeah, maybe it's useful to do that, but think of it as performance. OK, right. So now we've got six sentences. So that would be a decent place to stop. But let's say you've still got a few minutes for this task and you want to make it as good as possible. So let's think about the anything else option. Now, I'm sure this is what we wrote at the end of the um, notes up here. I'm sure you've got loads of ideas for anything else. Uh, Ruby Sapphire says, would it pierce the skin? Oh, I hope not. Now, that would be extreme. If you've got a brush that could pierce the skin, then I dread to think what this brush is made out of. I think that's a bit extreme. Uh, if someone wrote that, I'd think, um, wow, what are they brushing their pet with? So I, I wouldn't go with that myself, but I don't think it's, I don't know. I'm not sure it's quite right, but I don't think it's an enormous problem either. It, in this riddle writing, it would be an enormous problem if you pierced your animal's skin, obviously. Um, um, Ingrid says, if you don't know something for sure, can you make a reasonable guess, like how far to comb the fur? Um, uh, of course, a reasonable guess is, is, is inherently reasonable, and so that's absolutely fine. But I think there's a more sensible response, which is if you don't know something, then say something else. So you said, make a reasonable guess like how far to comb the fur. Well, just don't say how far to comb the fur. And then you've avoided getting it wrong, to be honest. I mean, it's going to depend on the kind of animal anyway. So um, a lot of these things, if you don't know what to say, just um, skip it. 11 plus master says, stop when the pet doesn't like it. Um, I mean, that would be absolutely fine if you put that in. I've got no problem with that at all. It might not always be practical advice because some pets just don't like being brushed, but you still need to brush them sometimes. Um, so, uh, well, uh, another good question from Ingrid. Robert, if you wrote more than seven sentences, would you lose marks? I don't honestly know the answer to that, so I'm going to guess the answer. I think if you wrote eight or nine sentences, I think it would probably be okay. I struggle to imagine the examiner taking marks off for that. But there's a really good rule for exams. Just do exactly what you are told to and nothing else. Just always do exactly what they tell you to and then you can't go wrong. So rather than asking me, is it okay to write eight sentences? Just don't. Just write six or seven and then there's no problem. So I think that's the most sensible approach. Um, whenever you get a question, you think, is it okay if I do something slightly different? Just don't. Do the task. Safest that way. And then you don't go out of the exam thinking, have I destroyed, have I ruined my prospects by doing something different from what they said? You don't need to worry about that. Right, the anything else. Okay, so what might the anything else be? Well, there are loads of things you could say. Um, um, and so it's just brainstorming. Um, my brainstorm is I finished the job. I've stopped brushing. Um, I'm happy with the result. I want my pet to feel happy about it so that next time they cooperate and don't try and jump off my lap before I finished. And how can I make them feel happy about it? Well, the easiest way uh, is bribery. Give them a treat. So why not finish by suggesting that you give your animal a treat, but also explain why again, to show that you're thinking about the reader's questions. The reason why is so that it's easier next time. Um, so you could say, um, give your pet a treat so that it's easier next time. But that's a bit bossy. You don't have to do it. It's an option. So why not say, consider giving your pet a treat. Um, and because, yeah, because the purpose of it is to make it easier next time. Let's start with that. So let's say if you want your task to be easier next time, 
But that implies it was difficult this time. How about if you want the task to be even easier next time, because that implies it was easy this time, which is reassuring if someone's reading these instructions before they've done it, uh, which you hope they are, um, consider rewarding your pet with a treat. There we are. So it's just those simple thoughts about exactly how we want to say it, about the reader's point of view and being precise, that, whoa, camera focus, um, that gets us to a nice, clear, good sentence. So if you want the task, what do we say? If you want the task, to be, and thinking about precision, we came up with even easier, to be even easier, that's reassuring language because it implies that the task is easy anyway. If you want the task to be even easier next time, consider giving your pet a treat, but let's be clear about why we're giving it. It's a reward, so consider rewarding. Oop, that's like rewording. Oh, never mind. It says rewarding. Okay, it says rewarding. It does, honestly, don't argue with me. <laughs> Consider rewarding your pet with a treat. Um, notice actually, I'll put an exclamation mark there because it's um, this kind of exclamation thing, you know, give them a treat, spoil them. Um, notice the kind of tone that I keep up through this. I try to be polite to the person reading these instructions and not bossy. So I don't say, give your pet a treat. I'm suggesting what they might wish to do. I can't make them. But equally, I'm not wasting time in flowery roundaboutery. I'm not saying, you may wish to consider giving your, rewarding your pet with a treat. Consider is perfectly polite. It's fine. It doesn't waste words. Um, but it isn't bossy either. So that balance between being clear and not using loads of extra words, but also not being too blunt and bossy, it takes a bit of practice to find it. Um, I think it's something I've learned through writing squizillions of emails to parents every day and finding a tone that gives advice without sounding like I'm telling them how to run their own families. Um, that's the kind of tone, I hope I manage it, that's the kind of tone that you want to practice for this kind of work, but also because it's really useful for all kinds of other things that you might have to handle in your lives. Um, okay, anyway, there we are. Let's read through this very quickly. So we've got seven sentences here, I'm pretty certain. Sentence one, without causing it discomfort, hold your pet firmly and confidently. Development, by showing your authority, you will reassure them about what is going to happen. Okay, first point done with two sentences. Brush in gentle, regular strokes, following the fur's natural direction. Is that? No, that's three, sorry. Four. Be particularly careful in the vicinity of sensitive points such as eyes, ears and genitals. Whenever you feel the brush gripping less readily, tease out the loose fur from between its bristles, perhaps putting it in a paper bag set aside for this purpose. Don't try to achieve perfection. Excessive brushing can irritate an animal's skin. If you want the task to be even easier next time, consider rewarding your pet with a treat. Okay? So I hope you realise how easy this kind of task is, essentially. This is really simple English. I'm not doing anything fancy, anything way out there that, that you at the age of 9, 10 or 11 um, don't already know. I mean, you'll know all this English. You know how to write sentences like this. Um, there's nothing showy-offy. But it is, I hope, a really good piece of writing because, if I say so myself, because I'm thinking about the reader's point of view and thinking about what questions they might wish to ask me. I'm talking to them in a sensitive, polite way, and I am being very precise. I am thinking exactly what do I want to communicate? What are the best words available to me to communicate that clearly? And then I am using those words and just doing it. Other things to remind you, my plan at the beginning was a really simple list of things to cover without any extra detail and it was written in a way that if I'd used up my six, my seven sentences by somewhere around here 
I could just stop without it looking like an incomplete set of instructions. But I left myself some extra points at the end, when to stop and anything else, so that I had some ideas there um, if I ran out of things to say with some sentences left. So I wouldn't just be repeating myself or saying things for the sake of it. Um, and I think they're the main things that I wanted to communicate. It isn't complex. People find it difficult because they overcomplicate it um, by trying to be really fancy um, or by coming up with just really weird advice. Um, or they kind of oversimplify by just doing a bullet point list which doesn't show off their English skills. You've got to write a nice paragraph where the ideas follow each other naturally and the person feels like you're talking to them in a naturally communicative fashion. And that's it. Okay, uh, thank you everybody for your uh, very kind words about um, about Hans, our cat, who was indeed a lovely cat um, who died about six months ago, uh, five months ago. Uh, and yes, that was very sad. Uh, so sadly, I am not brushing him for this video. Right, okay, uh, onwards to the... This is a tip I've given various times in the past, but it's appropriate now because some people have January exams coming up. And this is that it's important to keep a sense of perspective. So yes, you want to do well in your exams. Yes, they are important and they feel important to you. But you've got the Christmas holidays coming up. There are things in life more important than 11 plus exams. So give yourself some time off over Christmas. Take a break, enjoy time with your family, see your friends. If you celebrate Christmas, then enjoy celebrating it and not thinking about the exams for a couple of days. If your family doesn't celebrate Christmas, still give yourself some time off and enjoy having a holiday and then get back into your preparation refreshed. Don't think just because your exams are around the corner that you need to be studying every day and that enjoying yourself is for losers. No, enjoying yourself and taking time to relax and remind yourself about what really matters in life is for the people who succeed and end up doing best. So be that person and be kind to yourself. Okay, right, I'm going to quickly take a few of your questions, um, if you have any. And then we'll wrap up. While I'm waiting for questions to come in, um, uh, let's see what else is going on in the comments here. Um, Ash says, thank you, Robert, for helping me in cr my creative writing. Uh, thank you for thanking me. I always very much appreciate it when people say that things I've done has have helped. The other thing I really appreciate, by the way, is when people... Um, uh, send me requests for things they'd like me to cover. Um, I Most of my lessons are actually responses to requests. This lesson was because somebody uh, a week or two ago said, please, could you cover instructional writing? So I've done it. So if it's something you want me to cover, don't suffer in silence. Um, write a comment under a video or send me an email or something like that. And I, if it's something I think other people will find useful, I will do a video on it. Simple as that. Um, most of my videos come about in that way. Um, Oh, very kind, you've remembered. Um, Harley says, are you still on crutches? Uh, no, I've got a kind of, uh, let's see if you can all see it. I've got a kind of, uh, I've got a brace on my foot to stop me flexing it too much so it heals wrong. Uh, but I'm not walking on crutches anymore, so it wasn't that serious. The crutches are now propped up in the corner and I haven't used them for about three days. Uh, 11 plus master, I had a mock test last week. Well, as you are the 11 plus master, um, I'm sure it went swimmingly. You should probably be setting the test really with a name like that. When is merch coming? It's coming in the new year when I've designed it. Stop bullying me. Uh, if you want if you want RSL branded merch now, you know how you can get it. You can go and uh, buy some of my books. The ultimate RSL merch. Go to the uh, shop page on the RSL Educational website. Good plug. Uh, how many marks was the question that we just did? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, oh. Historically, the CSSE have often given 15 marks for two short writing tasks together, and the mark is given for the overall standard of those two tasks. Don't worry about it. I mean, to be honest, if you're a CSSE student, they're not that clear about how they mark things. They do, they do release a marking table, but it's really general. Um, just produce a good bit of work. Don't worry about that. Um, 
Do we always have to write six or seven sentences? I think they've relaxed that wording recently in some exams. So no, not always. Um, just do what the question asks. But for a task like this, it's a good length. Um, Anant says, Sir Robert Stupendous Lomax. Um, what does the S in RSL mean? Uh, you've answered it. It means stupendous. But I especially like the fact that you have knighted me. Sir Robert, arise. Sir Robert. Arise, Sir Anant. Why don't we all just knight each other? Um, please, could you cover letter writing? Yes, good request. Um, really good idea. I will cover that at some point. But if you want me to remember it, don't write it in the live chat comments, which sadly disappear a couple of days after each lesson. Write it in the permanent comments under the video, and then I will remember. What should I do if I run out of space in an answer? Um... A slightly different thing to say is that you shouldn't really run out of space or something like this because if you do, it means that you're not doing what they wanted. So you're just churning out loads of ideas rather than writing something that's short and really well thought through. So it, before you write, think about the amount of space and think about what kind of answer that's suggesting. None of us are perfect. It can happen. It's happened to me in the past that you run out of space. In some exams, they'll actually give you writing paper for extra bits of extra answers. Sometimes there'll be a bit of space after the lines where you can squeeze it in. Sometimes you might write it at the end of the exam paper. But if you do that, make sure that you put a really clear note, not in tiny squiddly little writing, after the given answer space that says this answer continues at the end of the answer paper. Tell the examiner where to find it or they won't and you won't get the marks. So wherever you write extra, if it's on an extra bit of paper, if it's after the answer space, if it's squeezed into a margin, whatever it is, tell the examiner where to find it. That is the absolutely essential rule for any work that you don't put in the expected space. Okay, that's one of the basic rules of exams, a bit like um, never cross something out until you've already written the replacement. There are these basic rules you should always follow. Do you celebrate Christmas, said Raven. Yes, absolutely, I love Christmas. Um, um, but B, could you cover letter writing? I've answered that. Um, will you be here in the week in which Christmas is coming? I think you mean by that, will I be around next Tuesday? I am aiming to do a lesson next Tuesday, but I'm not absolutely certain yet. So I think I'll be aiming for it, but if I just feel it's too much and I can't be bothered in Christmas week, I'll send out an email to people on my mailing list like you know, the day before saying, sorry, no lesson this Tuesday. Uh, so I'm not sure yet. Um, if you want to find out these things, you need to be on my mailing list. How do you get onto my mailing list? Sign up for the free papers and solutions linked in the video description on YouTube. And that puts you onto my mailing list. And then you will find out about the lessons. You'll find out what topics I'm covering in advance. You'll get the worksheets in advance. And you'll discover things like I'm not doing this week's lesson. So to answer your question again, yes, probably next week. The Tuesday after that, no, not a chance I'm going to do one immediately after Christmas. And I'm sure you're very happy to hear that. Um, right. Uh, following up, I'm going to wrap up soon. Do you have any interview tips? Um, I should do a video on interview tips, actually. Um, but if you want them now, the best thing is go onto the RSL Educational website, my website, uh, go to the part of the website called, um, what's it called, Exam Advice and School Guides. There's an article there all about interview tips, and that's where my interview tips are. And if I do a video on it, I'll be saying basically the same things that I say in that article. So just go there and have a look. Uh, there are lots of other articles there that might be useful for people, by the way. Have a look. Um, have you done persuasive writing? Uh, there's lots of that on that in 11 plus lifeline, which you can also find out about on my website, links below the video. Um, have I done a video on it? Not yet, no, but it is something I want to cover at some point. Uh, persuasive writing, that's like writing essays um, in which you argue a point of view. Um, is it better to write small if you haven't got a lot of space? Um, yes, as long as it's really clear. Don't write tiny writing that someone can't read. Uh, I can't write too small because then it's even harder to read my horrible handwriting, for instance. Um, but if you haven't got a lot of space, the most important thing is to be concise. Like, say exactly what you want to say 
in a short and direct fashion. That's what you should be doing anyway. It's especially important when there isn't much space. Most people who run out of space, it's because they're using 10 words to say what they could say in five words and they're doing it again and again and lo and behold, they run out of space. So practice writing succinctly, concisely, directly, and today's big key word, precisely. Okay, Ingrid says, have a Merry Christmas, Robert. And um, I think I'll see you next Tuesday, but in case I don't, a big Merry Christmas to all of you as well. Um, thank you to 11 Plus Masters saying, I hope you get 5,000 subs. You can all help me do that by subscribing to this channel if you haven't already. It's been lovely to have you here and I'll probably see you next week. Bye-bye.